Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Tonight's session is our 40th webinar. Actually, that's quite a big deal, isn't it? 40. We'd not thought about the fact that it's got a zero on the end tonight. So tonight is our 40th webinar. If you've attended all of them, then you should get something very special. I think 40 sessions. Uh, lots of the team members have been here for every session. Um, even though I haven't actually thinking about it while I was on call, I've not been here for every session, but some team members have been here for every session. So welcome. Come on in. Um, I will just chat for the beginning because Kelly's uh, going to be a bit later arriving tonight. So I'm opening up tonight. Tonight, our session is, uh, as the title says, Strategies for Owning Your Placement and Overturning the Language of Deficit. And one of the reasons that we've asked Jennifer to come tonight is because I've heard her speak and I know how good she is in terms of presentations as well, but also Jennifer wrote a contribution into Outlanders. I know quite a few of you have got a copy of Outlanders. It is a really good book, Hidden Narratives from Social Workers of Colour. And I really liked um, Jennifer's contribution to that, which was about the language of deficit and how we can move on from the language of deficit. As a practice educator, I found that really interesting and it really prompted my own learning. So we thought, let's do a session on this. So tonight, that's what we're going to be looking at. Dave's done us a picture as usual, which we can then put onto YouTube. So you know you'll be able to watch this back on YouTube. And Jennifer has brought with her um, uh, Rosabella, who is a student and Christiana, who is a newly qualified social worker now, but has been a student with Jennifer. And so you'll, you'll have seen on our social media an introduction to them as our guest speakers. But I think Jennifer is going to uh, draw on ideas from uh, both Rosabella and from Christiana. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Jennifer, if that's OK. I shall switch myself on to mute and I'll just be here to move the slides for you. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, and so, first of all, a huge thank you for coming along tonight. I, I am really uh, surprised and overwhelmed and uh, I'm really flattered, actually, that we have um, students from all over the world uh, watching tonight. And um, depending on where you are in your social work education, what I'm hoping is that what will be shared with you are not just strategies for black and minority ethnic students, but strategies for all students that you can actually take with you. And certainly when I was speaking to Rosabella and I was talk, uh, speaking to Christiana, they were, when they were sharing with me their, their experiences, I thought actually there's a lot in there that actually is beneficial for all students. So I'm hoping that tonight we will be able to speak to uh, your experience, um, if you're a black and minority ethnic student, and certainly I'm hoping that if, you're, if you are a practice educator or you're a professional involved in practice education, I'm hoping that we will speak to you also. So thank you very much for the platform uh, being given. Uh, just to give you a bit of an outline of the session. Um, uh, so um, if I could ask uh, Siobhan, if you could go to the next slide. This is what we're going to be covering. We're going to be looking at the, the setting out the lie of the land, the student experience, the unique position occupied by social work, the language of deficit, and, and really how to begin a momentum of change. And then we're also going to be talking about those strategies. But before I move on, what I'd like to do um, is I'd like to kind of welcome the other two people who are joining me uh, in delivering this session and who will take up the second half of the session. So I'll take up the first kind of covering the, the literature and what I understand, and then we'll really go, go and talk to the other experts in relation to this. So if I can, first of all, just kind of introduce uh, Rosabella, and if you just want to say hello to everybody, that would be great. If you can come off of... Um... Can I meet Hi everyone, side? thank you very much Jenny. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining in today's session um, and congratulations to the team. I actually didn't realise it was a big 4-0, so yeah, <laughs> congratulations to you all. You've been doing this for a long time um, and I guess all the comments in the chat box is a testament to how many people tune in and how they, they benefit from it. So congratulations to you guys. Um, as Jenny said, I'm currently a, stu a student social worker 
a social worker and I'm about to go on my final place but my experience, previous experience has been in both safeguarding the vulnerable adults and children as well as in development and um, my area of expertise is more on um, safeguarding people within international development um, and hopefully I can, can contribute to today's session in a positive way. Thank you for having me. Thank you um, and let me now just move very quickly to Christiana. Hi, hello. Um, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I was saying earlier that uh, I've been attending this webinar and uh, they've really uh, impacted on me and I've really benefited a lot from the webinars. Uh, I'm a newly qualified social worker and I started my ESYE in January and um, I am here to share my, my placement experience to motivate people, to encourage us, to look out for ourselves and be the best that we can be. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both so very much. So, all right. So let me set out the lie of the land in terms of what are we talking about uh, when, when we're thinking about kind of owning placements and understanding what's happening, particularly in terms of wider social work. So again, Siobhan, if you can move on to the next slide. So what you've got in front of you there are some, some details about certainly the situation in terms of England. Um, and that in, a, in actual fact, uh, in 2019, social work had the highest proportion of applicants from the black ethnic community. And that was followed actually by nursing. So in actual fact, there are large numbers of students coming from black and minority ethnic communities who are joining social work as a profession. Okay, so that's the first thing that I wanted to say. And also, um, in terms of uh, the number of acceptances onto social work programs, this is also very high. And as you can also see, and this will no doubt be reflected in the audience who are hopefully listening tonight, the 42% of the students accepted on the programs are actually aged over 30. And that's the highest proportion for any subject in terms of um, uh, you know, academic uh, programs in England. Um, and so, what we see here is that there is a growing number of students that are from the black and minority ethnic community that are coming into social work. However, what we are also aware of, and this is um, uh, written about uh, a great deal, um, is the fact that as far as black and minority ethnic students are concerned, is that there is a significant and long-standing issue with regards to attainment. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean is that for um, white students, they are more likely to obtain a first and upper class degree than black students. Now I'm going to be talking about why is that the case, uh, but I'll do that shortly. Um, the fact is that this has been going on for a, an exceptionally long period of time and there have been a number of um, uh, thoughts about it and um, uh, arguments made as to why this might be. And with regards to that, even when research has been under, undertaken and that research has controlled things such as gender, age, previous qualifications, um, and when they've looked at all of those factors, the fact still remains that black students are less likely to obtain a first class or upper class degree when leaving their academic qualification at university. And that's across the entirety of the higher education sector. So what does that mean for social work? Well, in actual fact, what that means for social work is that it's replicated also in social work. And I think that's what needs to be to be taken on board. So we're not just talking about something that is um, confined maybe to a particular course. We're talking about something that is a characteristic of higher education in England. And this notion of um, a, an attainment gap um, may have its roots in institutional structures and also the curriculum of universities or the higher education sector. 
Next slide, please, Siobhan. Thank you. So, what does that mean for black and minority ethnic students? Well, again, thought has been given to, in actual fact, why is there this persistent attainment gap and what might be the reasons that sit behind it? And there have been a number of reasons that have been put forward, as you can begin to see on the slide. And so one of the first reasons is around this notion of uh, black and minority students, um, uh, you know, employing what they call more surface learning. And um, when academics are talking about surface learning, they're talking about the type of learning where what the student does is they retain the information uh, for the purposes of just passing the test and they memorize the facts, but actually there's difficulty in applying them. Um, there's also, as you can see from the slide, there's the negative impact on, uh, uh, in, in terms of the stereotype and how that impacts on academic performance. And I'll be talking about Steele's work very shortly. But really just moving on from that, what we have to be careful of when we're particularly thinking about, um, it might be the problem of the student, is that it actually locates the problem within the individual. And rather than looking at wider issues around a sense of belonging, self-esteem and self-actualization. And what that also means is it produces dangerously an unhelpful deficit model around black and minority students. Um, other ways of thinking about it that um, uh, uh, academics have uh, taken on board is that in actual fact, where you have um, uh, black students who are entering into uh, higher education, there is this impact of the negative stereotype. And what the work of Steele has done, and he's an academic in America, what he, what he did was he highlighted the issue of um, how we are all affected by what people think about us. Um, and, and no doubt as a student, you will have, if you've gone into your first placement, you'll have been desperately thinking, what do they think about me? I have to make the right impression. You know, I need to pass this placement. And what Steele talks about is the fact that where someone begins to think about um, and, are, and is aware of what others might think about them, particularly that which is negative, then that actually affects their performance. And he has done a, a range of psychological experiments. And this was psychological experiments were particularly around um, females and maths. And basically the experiment that he ran was uh, in relation to, uh, he, he had a controlled experiment. So the first half of the experiment was um, actually uh, having a number of male and female students sit a maths test. Before they sat the maths test, what actually happened was there was a lecturer there, got up, talked about the maths test, and, and uh, during that talk, dropped in some very negative connotations about females undertaking maths. And what happened was after the maths test was taken, the females who undertook that maths test did very, very badly. He then repeated this psychological experiment again in exactly the same way, but this time the person who was talking about the test stated some very positive things about females and their ability to do maths. The maths test was undertaken with a different set of students and surprise, surprise, what happened was these females performed much better in terms of that maths test. So what we have here and what Steele is saying is that when you as an individual think that you are, um, you may be thought of uh, in a negative light, that that then reflects in terms of your overall performance. And he's repeated this experiment, not just with uh, math students, female math, but he's repeated it with black students in terms of performance, in terms of their academic performance, in terms of their sporting performance as well. And so there is something to be said about how others see you and their thoughts towards you and how you think of that might affect your overall performance. What we're also aware of 
is that in terms of black and minority ethnic students on social work programs, that they are taking much longer to complete the program than their white counterparts. But also what we do know, and as you will have been taught on your social work program is that as far as the curriculum is concerned, it talks about things like anti-discriminatory and anti-oppressive practice. But actually in doing so, what that might lead to is this very false sense of security about the way in which practitioners and educators within social work um, actually take on board and believe that they practice um, in terms of diversity and difference. And I think this is why today's session might be very challenging for people. And I, I suppose um, I don't want to apologize for that because I think there is a movement and there is a change happening within social work. So next slide, please, Siobhan, thank you. So what does that mean in terms of the student experience when there is this, um, uh, uh, range of uh, factors happening that almost appear invisible, but without a shadow of a doubt, as you speak to students over time, there is something definitely happening. Thanks, Siobhan. Next slide, please. So, and if you just kind of work through pressing the buttons, what you, you'll, you'll go, you'll hit some of these words. So over the years of experience that I've had, and I've been working in higher education for over 10 years, what I've come across are many statements made in relation to black students. So words such as the student does not have. The next one is the student is not able. Another one is the student is not capable of. The student needs to understand. The problem with the student is, okay. And for me, what that speaks of is a very deficit, negative type of language that is around black students. And I have, in my ten, over 10 years of experience, watched many students, black, black and minority ethnic students, not go at the same progression pace as their white counterparts, okay? And because of that, that led me to write what I did in terms of Outlanders actually recognizing that this language of deficit can actually have a very damaging effect upon students and almost get them to the point of actually feeling that they are not able to actually uh, complete their program. And I have also witnessed many students who have not, black and minority students that have not successfully completed the program. So there's something going on and maybe it's about time that we begin to recognize and realize what that is. We also know um, in terms of the very negative experiences that a number of black and minority ethnic students have had, that it can operate at a natural fact at three levels. So again, Siobhan, if you can just kind of work through the slides, thank you. So what we have is that that language of deficit can operate at the level of the relationship between the student and the practice educator, that the student is not doing well, that the student doesn't know what they're doing, they're not able to, they can't. Then you have the, um, uh, the kind of deficit in relation to the student and the social work team. Um, and so there is the notion that the student does not fit within the team, the student is not an asset for the team. Um, and in actual fact, Whilst, again, and this is based on, you know, students talking to me about their experiences. So the students is seemingly accepted by the team, but it's only when the student gets into supervision that concerns will be raised via the practice educator that have come from the team, but the team, of, team members have never spoken to that student directly. And then the other level, is around the relationship between the student and the university. And again, this can be quite uh, challenging and also can be damaging because many students feel that in actual fact, the university should be supporting them and that is not necessarily happening, okay? And there's a, an automatic assumption that the student has done something wrong rather than 
taking the time to kind of sit back and, and say, actually, what is going on here? Help us understand what is going on here. So there have been, and that's what I've seen over the years, and yes, it's anecdotal evidence. However, what is very clear is that there is research from TEDM and there's re research from Fairclough, which clearly indicates that students, black and minority ethnic students, really do experience negative placements and it does have a damaging effect upon them. So let's move to the next slide, please. All right, so what are these damaging effects? Let's talk about them in a little bit of detail. So we have things like the loss of confidence um, and ability in the light of negative comments. So it becomes really difficult for students to actually turn that around when assumptions, as someone has said in the chat, assumptions are made about their capability and those assumptions happen to be very, very negative. There's also um, a sense of isolation for the student. Um, there's a sense of being different and that difference might be because of that student's accent or their written work, or even as Tiden says, their physical presence. There is with it a sense of isolation and hyper visibility, and also a very high sense of anxiety in relation to assessment. And also, again, what students have shared, uh, um, both with me and has also been documented in literature in relation to student experiences, is that they also face discrimination by service users. And that is not effectively handled by the placement provider. Um, and so when it's challenged, it then becomes very difficult for the student. Okay, so let's move to the, the next slide, please. So why is this the case? Why might all of this be happening? Well, looking at the literature, there seems to be three reasons, potentially three reasons. So the first one is in relation to what we call unconscious bias. Maybe people have come across it before as part of their studies on, on their social work programs. But this is something that we all experience. And I think I really want to emphasize that. This is something that we all experience. And what it is, is about is the fact that our brains make incredibly quick judgments and assessments of people and situations without us actually realizing. And that's because in actual fact, the moment we go into a situation, we have to begin to make sense of it. And can you imagine trying to make sense of every new situation that you are in would become overwhelming. You couldn't actually cope. You couldn't even get through the day. So what our brain does is it does this shortcut. And what happens is it creates these biases. And these biases are based on our background, our cultural environment, and our personal ex experiences. And we may not even be aware that we have such biases until they're tested. Hence why you're in a social work program and we talk about values all the time, because these are hugely important. Um, Kahneman, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow, suggests that our mental processes can be conceptualized on two, uh, in, via two systems. So the first system is fast, automatic, frequent, emotional, stereotypic, and subconscious. Okay. And um, this is a way whereby we operate really quickly. It, it gives us no effort and we immediately begin to make sense of what is going on around us. Maybe not accurately, but it's a way of helping us um, uh, think about where, we, where, where we're at and how we respond to that. And then we have the second system, which is slow, it's effortable, it's infrequent, it's logical, and it's calculating, okay? And actually it demands a great deal of attention and time in terms of our mental exercise, okay? And it also includes complex computations. What we tend to do is we tend to go with fast automatic thinking. Why do we do that? Because we're seeking to save time. But the danger is relying on fast automatic thinking and making those rapid judgments about new situations that causes people to be put in social categories and then acting on those social categories in a way that is completely negative. 
Another way of thinking about it is through othering. So othering is not about liking or disliking someone. And again, it's based on conscious or unconscious assumptions about people or about a group that is not known to us and that we may feel threatened by. And othering often is attributed to negative characteristics of a particular people group and that differentiate them from the normative social group. In other words, it's simply saying, you're not like me and I'm not like you. Um, and the really dangerous thing about othering is it's a way of negating another person's individual humanity. And consequently what happens is that that other becomes less worthy and has less dignity. And again, this is a, a, a phenomenon that happens without conscious effort or even awareness. Okay. So we are all open to this. We are all, this could possibly happen to all of us. And if you're a practice educator, if you are an educator in any way whatsoever, just as much as, as yourself, I am too. I'm open to that happening in terms of what I do and how I respond to the students that I come across. Okay. Um, and what it creates is this invisible barrier between myself and that other individual. And then the other way of thinking about it is through uh, the notion of microaggressions. And this was coined by Chester M. Pierce. And uh, I'm just going to read out what he wrote about uh, um, uh, microaggressions and how he witnessed them uh, being made against black people. And obviously this is an American notion that we're talking about, but he talked about these racial assaults to black dignity and black hope are incessant and cumulative. Any single one may be gross. In fact, the major vehicle for racism in this country and where he's talking about the United States is offenses done by black, but to blacks by whites in this sort of gratuitous, never ending way. These offenses are microaggressions. Almost all black white racial interactions are characterized by put downs done in automatic, pre conscious, or unconscious fashion. These mini disasters accumulate. It is the sum total of multiple microaggressions by whites to blacks that has this pervasive effect to the stability and peace of this world. I only need mention the word George Floyd um, and it becomes, there's something going on. And I think we're, we're aware of what that is. But I think by thinking about the notions of unconscious bias and othering, this begins to help us to think about actually what is happening here in terms of our own behaviors and how we actually respond. And I think we can take that into the placement arena. Let's move to the next slide and think about the unique position that uh, social work has. I've already mentioned the fact that um, within particularly, you know, and I'm, uh, I suppose I'm speaking here to the international get, uh, guests, but within British social work, there's a, there is an emphasis on anti-oppressive and anti-racist practice and anti-discriminatory practice in all of its forms. So not just where it comes to issues of ethnicity, but other issues around gender, uh, disability. So it looks right across the piece. And I, and I suppose what you would think is that as a profession, we would be well protected against this. So that, thanks, uh, Siobhan, let's move to the next slide. And even within the practice education standards that practice educators have to work to, again, there is this emphasis on ensuring that, um, you know, practitioners question their own values, their prejudices, that they are aware of the diversity of their students and also about other learners, and that they work in a strength-based way. So you would think that as a profession, we would be immune. But the fact is that the research tells us that we are not immune. 
And you would also, rec and also we can also recognize that in terms of higher education, even though we are part of the higher education system, in terms of the programs that are delivered in England, the fact still remains that there is still an attainment gap between black students and white students. So in other words, I suppose what I'm saying is, we are not immune in any way whatsoever. And so what that calls for is a, a, a momentum for change. Next slide, please. And that momentum uh, for, for change, I think is beautifully wrapped up in uh, the quote by Doyle and Shardlow, where they talk about recognizing, naming, and importantly, valuing differences, but we're not sentimentalizing them. And because we're not doing that, it means that we have to challenge the stereotypes. It means that we have to check our assumptions and keep on with our, keep on thinking about anti-oppressive practice. And this is not just in terms of um, educators like myself, but also practice educators. And that's got to also extend to the team also. So there's a need for us to look at and address not only within higher education, but also within social work much more widely, going right down to the teams by which a student is placed in. And also to the practice educator, we have to look at and be brave enough to address the complex and multi-layered issues that discrimination, where it lies and where it exists. So, let's move on to the next slide. If that's okay, Siobhan, if you'd like to move on to the next slide. Okay, so there are a number of considerations that can be made. Okay, and these are really just considerations for you to think about in terms of um, your experiences and in terms of uh, uh, practice. What are your thoughts about, you know, if you're a black and minority ethnic student, what are your thoughts about your placement? What does that actually mean for you? How do you, you know, how do you manage effectively your placement? And so this is the point where I hand over to uh, both uh, Rosabella and Christiana, and I'm going to kind of manage this conversation a little bit in the sense of, uh, um, uh, you know, leading it in terms of its direction. But much of what's going to be said really does come from their experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, begin with Rosabella first and uh, just thinking about those three areas whereby um, we can consider that where the language of deficit might lie. Let's just go back to that slide um, and it's called the language of deficit. So let's just think about it again. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Just think about it. Um, so uh, just beginning with you, Rosabella, just, just talk to us really about if we were thinking about what strategies could be put in place, particularly when thinking about the relationship between you as a student and your practice educator, and then I'll move to Christiana for a couple of ideas as well and a couple of strategies. What strategies would you suggest to, the, to our audience today? Okay, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I mean, in, in, in the slides so far, you've covered very sensitive topic, um, topic area, right? And it, it's a topic area that makes others uncomfortable. It, you know, challenges the values and, and thought processes of, of, of processes of others, and that's okay. But I think in the first instance for a student, and this is not just for, you know, black and ethnic minority students, but students generally, um, I think the first the first foundation that you lay in building a relationship with your PE stems from your communication right from the word go. Um, but there needs to be a level of awareness of self. Um, and that's a, that's that's my first point of strategy an awareness of self and then being aware of yourself and then relating to that other person um, and remembering that you're you're relating to someone else, be it even in the sense of the power relations at play, they are first and foremost an individual. And so the first point of communication with them, be aware of yourself and be aware of how you are introducing yourself to them, open up, opening up yourself to them, how you present yourself to someone, how you command through the use of your language tells them 
the kind of person that you are, the kind of values that you hold. Um, and it can be challenging, especially, I, I say especially because, of course, the stats, the research proves it, especially for Black and ethnic minority students. It can be challenging. You're nervous, you're anxious, you're scared. Um, if, like most students, you've heard about other people's experiences, then that's guiding, <laughs> that's, you know, at the back of your mind, even before you, you reach out to your PE, even at the start of a start of a placement. Um, but what I would say is there's a need in self-awareness to not focus on what you've heard other people have experienced and go with an open mind and start off building that relationship with an, an open mind. Um, and with communication, building the first step, different methods of it. Because of COVID, we've all been forced to, you know, if you're like myself and you're not that great with technology, then you've been challenged to become more familiar with it. Um, and language is in, in, it's interpreted differently when it's spoken versus when it's written. And so being aware of that, even as you communicate, as you reach out to, to your PE or as you build that rapport with them. Um, if we go back to how things used to be, then you have that more face-to-face -face contact. Again, self-awareness and self-presentation in how you command what you speak to them about. It helps. So that, that's the first, for me, first point of, um, of, of, of the strategy. Now, going to the PE, I think Again, for, for PEs, I think there needs to be that level of awareness. So my previous uh, practice educator was, was quite open and, and appreciative of me challenging um, her to be aware of the power relation, first of all, um, but also then being um, intentional for be intentional for change. So be intentional about the relationship that you create with that student. Um, be intentional about the differences that they have, but also see them as their area of strength and build on it rather than critique where, where you feel a student lacks. So again, in building that relationship, be aware and be intentional about the processes that you, you go through with that student. Um, and I think for me, that for, for that first level, that's the key um, strategy that I think is at play, the communication self-awareness and then how you command how you want to be spoken to and how you want to be treated throughout that placement process. Great, thank you for that. I'm gonna move over to Christiana. So Christiana, again, just looking at that first level of the practice education and the student, what strategies, you've, you've undertook your last placement, you successfully passed it, you're now in an ASYE program, please talk to us. All right, uh, thank you, Jenny. I think for me, the first thing would be having a sense of responsibility, that you yourself as a student, you have responsibility. It is not the responsibility of the PE alone, it is not the responsibility of the team alone, you are there, for learning opportunities and take that opportunity, take that responsibility. And it, it's been aware that uh, you are responsible for your own learning and take that opportunity. You know, placements are different. We have statutory, we have charity, we have here and there, and uh, there are always learning opportunity. It's now left for you to take that responsibility on yourself to identify those learning opportunities. It could be going with someone on a visit. It might be uh, completing reports. It might be answering phone calls. It can be anything. So it is that responsibility that you have that you are there to learn and then identifying those and utilizing that opportunity to the fullest. And then um, I wanted to say about our feedback as well. You know, when you're taking feedback from, from practice educator, some will tell you along the line that, okay, this is how you're progressing. This is what we are worried about, but some will not. For instance, uh, during my first placement, uh, it was during my interim judgment meeting that I got to understand that I didn't pass all my PCL. And with me, within me, I've passed all my PCLs. I've done what I was supposed to do, but due to lack of communication between my on-site supervisor and my PE, I ended up not passing about two to three PCLs. I remember myself sitting down and crying and I didn't know what I wanted to write in the comment box because as a student, you have to write comments uh, after reading your report. And I thought to myself, and uh, something just came to me that I needed to pick my battle wisely. I could have gone forward and say, oh, uh, on-site on supervisor, I have done this, I have done that. These are my evidence, but I did not do that. What I did, I just, I said, okay, I appreciate the opportunity that has been given to me. I appreciate the support and the warmness of the team. And regarding the, the things that has been identified as concerns, this is my action plans. 
henceforth, I'm going to be communicating more with my PE. I'm going to be open and, you know, things like that. Do that action plan for yourself. Don't let someone else do it for you. And then set a, a day of review that will never come before you end your placement. So is that taking that responsibility? And also, uh, in terms of being humble, being proactive, being uh, identify things to do to for you to um, what what is it for you to meet the PC health? You know, uh, there's one of the domain of PC health that is very very difficult to to meet. That one is the leadership. <laughs> so is being able to identify what you can do to meet that one, and then being proactive. You know. Uh, when they need uh, someone to take the minute, say, you can do it. Yeah, I'm ready to do it. I'm happy to do it. That is my, that is my technique. I'm happy to do everything in my placement. Even when I'm not happy to do it, I am always happy. If it's for me to do calendar for, for duty, for duty phone, I am happy to do it. If, it's for, if, if they need someone to go in and join visit, I am happy to do so. So having that sense of awareness of yourself, like Bella said, like creating opportunities for yourself, having that responsibility, for your own learning, for your own development. I think it's very important as well. Mm. Okay, brilliant. Thank Definitely. you for that. Um, I can see lots of, of, of uh, you know, comments in the chat and that's fantastic. And I'm, uh, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, some of this is really resonating with people. And I would say again, that this is, these are, you know, whilst this is very much aimed at black and minority ethnic students, this is good practice for any student, mm. absolutely good practice for any student. So, do take some of these points on board. Okay, so let's then move to the next one, which is around the student and the social work team. So again, just going back to yourself, Bella. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, I think just touching very quickly on what Christiana said, um, pairing awareness with responsibility. And that kind of goes into that next part of building that relationship between the student social worker and the social work team. You're responsible for the placement. I think one of the key things that I tell people now after my experience is it's your placement, first and foremost. Um, and I get that you're going to work within an organization, but you're going there because it's your placement, right? So you will get out of it what you decide to make out of it. So you definitely need to take ownership of that placement. You need to take responsibility. And linking that to the social work team, I think a key strategy, again, is to recognize um, the, the organizational cultures that are at play within that organization that you're joining into. So many a times um, when I've spoken to previous uh, student social workers or even some of my own peers, Students get caught up a lot in, um, I call them the politics at play within the organization that you're in, um, and then either also get sucked, sucked into the cultural, um, the organizational cultures that are at play. You have to remember, first and foremost, your, your responsibility and why you're there and not get caught up in those things. And how do you do that? Being proactive in the placement and remembering what your roles are. And these are things that need to be defined very early on when you start the placement within the team. Um, so be proactive in, in, in the kind of work that you do, because also everyone in that team is watching you, right? Everyone in that team is feedback, is going to give feedback about your performance, your interactions with service users um, or patients, depending on where you're placed. Um, and also just how you, your persona, how you're relating, how, whether you're getting the job done. So be proactive, be, be aware of the organizational cultures, be proactive in the work that you do when you're doing it, take ownership of it, it's your work. Where, where you feel there's lack of work to do, create work. There is always a gap. And that's something I, I realize a lot of students don't do. We sometimes wait to be given the work. Sometimes you need to take in taking ownership. You need to be proactive within the team that you're in. Be ready to learn and, and say, show me this. I would like to take responsibility for this. I might need a little bit more guidance, but I'm willing to. You know, that, that, that proactiveness within the team is very, very important. And also just creating a good rapport with the team members, again, that you're working with, because you're coming in, whether you like it or not, as a student, you're coming in as an outsider. These are team members that exist within the team before you come in. So your role when you come in is as a student social worker. Of course, we want to feel included and, and, and to, there should be a level of inclusion, but you are the outsider that's joining in when and your, your placement is only for a certain period of time. So you, you're only there for a while and then you're going to go. The mark you leave is dependent on how you relate to those people in the team. Whether some teams will want you back later when you're done as, as, a, as an employee, it's all dependent on how you relate to the team. 
but be proactive be aware of the of, of the organizational coaches and and be wise about the ones that you subscribe to <laughs> more importantly um, and for me that's the strategy for you know building that relationship between the so student social worker and and the team okay christiana all right thank you jenny so what i've done in the past is um on Monday morning, I send an uh, email around to the team members and say, oh, good morning. Uh, if anyone have anything interesting going on, if you have any challenging case and you think it would be a good opportunity for me to shadow or to learn one or two things, kindly let me know. So I'll copy in my PE and my PE is very proactive with that. She will be on the night and say, no one has responded to Christiana. Is anybody going out? Is something happening or what is not happening? So that, that is good. And then uh, something again is I offer myself, you know, to go on joint visits, to complete chronology, to do things, you know, that usually the social workers, uh, they do normally. So I offer support, I offer to help, so we, which makes me be, um, a, a good part of the team, someone to rely on, something I can do. And then I think at the end, I ended up creating uh, a gap that was that that was really, really missed after I finished my placement. And then something I, I've also done is I don't gossip. I don't go, when they're talking about themselves, when they're talking about politics in the organization, about other teams and all that, I keep my mouth shut. Learn to mind your own business. If, you're not, if you don't have anything to do, pretend to be busy on your system. Just find something to do. Do your portfolio. Check your check. Um, you, you, you check the library, online library. Find an article to read. Just pretend to be busy. Do something. And then also, uh, I think it's, it's also good to have a good relationship with the team. You know, in the morning, when you get to the office or whatever, don't, don't sit down and expect people to come and say good morning to you or hello to you. They will not do that. They expect you to go around to the chair and the table and say, hello, are you okay? Are you all right? If someone has been on um, on sick leave or had no leave, when they come back, go to them and say, hi, are you okay? I learned you were on sick leave. How was your holiday? How is that and that? Then also um, learn to be humble, you know, humble yourself. When you're invited for, for a drink, for lunch, go with them. If you're not invited, sit down and go for your own for your own lunch. But if they offer to make you a drink, instead of you sitting down to make to, to expect them to make that drink for you, go with them to make that drink. You can even offer to make them drinks. And also, um, learning to listen. Don't gossip. Yeah, I've said that. Then showing the emotions, you know, when things happen. Go to the team, go to the member of the team and say, oh, I'm sorry, this is what I heard. Are you okay? I was just checking after you. And then uh, just be smart, you know, mind your business, be proactive, stay smart. Um, just, just create that communication, that, that, that relationship, sorry, that relationship with the team. It goes a long way. You know, they, they will end up liking you. And I think their input is also significant to, to, to your final report of the placement. So just, just, just if, it's, if, if it's left for you to do eye service and pretend for people to like you, I think it's better you to, to, to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So let's now move to the kind of final uh, layer, which is between students and the university. And this is much more complex as you can well imagine. So again, what I'll do is I'll go back to Rosabella. If we can begin with you, Rosabella, and then we'll go to Christiana. Looks like we, I'm going to work the other way around because we may have a technical I may have lost her. All right, okay, we may, I think we might have a technical problem. So I'll just go back to you, Christiana, if you would like to kind of share with us some ideas about how to manage things again with the university. And again, I think it's also about thinking about if you are experiencing any difficulties, how should you potentially manage that? So just thinking about that. Yeah, uh, with the university, I would say you have to be able to manage your interpersonal skill and communication with the university. Uh, if there's anything going on in your placement and you think this thing is, is, uh, is going to, it's not going to head end in a good way for you, I think it's better you, you take that responsibility first to let your PVT know about it. Because the placement, the, the placement organization, the university, the individuals there, they have personal relationships. So if you don't do that, if you don't take that action to take your case forward first, 
I think at the end of the day, your case might just end up being discussed over a cup of tea or over, over a few drinks that you're going to have. So taking it forward yourself and presenting your case in a professional manner, you know, you have to be professional. You have to calm down. You have to choose your battle wisely. You know, present it in a timely manner, be professional about it, be mindful of the language, the wordings that you're going to use. And then say what your experience is and what your worries are and how you would want to be supported. And I think for university as well, the PVTs, they like to hear about what is going on well for you. And they want to hear about what you are learning. How are you coping? What, what, what are the opportunities that you're getting from the placement? They want to hear about the good things, which is good. You can be keeping tracks on them, you can be keeping checks on them, checking in weekly or daily or whatever you want, just to let them have that uh, satisfaction that you're doing well. And if there's, if there's anything going on, just let them know. And I think um, in terms of uh, being friendly with your PVT is also important. I remember my PVT telling me at my interim judgment that the first time she spoke to me, I, I came across as, as being defensive. But now I have developed some communication skills and I, I presented more approachable, which I felt okay. I needed to, I, I don't know what happened, but you know, just being that person, you know, improve yourself. If you think that they are, hey, we are not perfect. We have areas where we need improvement. If you think that um, you need to work on yourself in terms of your verbal communication or written communication, do that on your on yourself. We have lots and lots and lots of responsibility and, and too much is expected from us. Okay, thank you for that. So just to answer the question that was in the chat about what is a PVT, it's a placement visiting tutor. Everybody has one. We just, at different universities, we call them different things. So what we, I, I don't know, technical team, if, if Rosabella is back. I'm is back, there... apologies. <laughs> Fantastic. No, please go ahead. So we're on the final bit between the student and the university. Thank you, Jenny. Um, apologies for the technical difficulty there. Um, okay, so going, to, going on to the student and university team, I think the first thing I, I, I like to point out with that is that as students, you already have a relationship with the university before you go on to placement because you know you start from that academic perspective before you go into your practical placement. And so don't forget that. Um, a lot of the times when we go on to placement because of the practical aspects of things, we tend to forget the academic um, commitments that we, we, that, that we are on, a, an, on an academic journey and that this is a part of it and that we already have a foundation of relationship created with our university and not to forget that. And so for students, sometimes what we find ourselves doing is we leave, we leave that interaction between ourselves and the uni while on placement, we leave it there on the side until something goes wrong. Um, and if nothing goes wrong, then it's, you wait for you know, recall days where you have um, the, the classes that are helpful and, and, and helpful for you to take back into placement. And then that's the kind of only interaction that we have with the university during the placement. But you already have that foundation. and so ensure that you continue to communicate irrespective of whether there's a problem or there's no problem while you're on placement. So again, um, Christiana just mentioned um, the PVT uh, placement visiting tutor for every, every university, it might, it might be referred to as a different thing, but it's that connect, that link from the uni that you have while you're on placement. And again, maintain a sense of communication with this person whenever, whenever even if it's, a, so some of my colleagues um, have said to me, oh, well, what, what I did, Bella, was I would drop an email to my placement visiting tutor every every week, end of the week. I'll send a, a kind of a weekly email saying, oh, this is how placement's been. It's been really good. I have no, I still have no concerns. It's going well and leave it at that. And what that does is you control that relationship between yourself and the university um, in the sense that you are initiating that rapport so that when something comes up, you've already got that flow of communication between them. Um, and so as a strategy, key, it's, it's key to maintain that relationship that you've already built before going on placement with your university through that placement visiting tutor that you have. Um, the second strategy that um, I would like to recommend for all students, you know, again, relation between the uni and, and the student is not forgetting your academic um, commitments. So again, while you're on placement, it's, it's a practical, it's a practical sector. So you're, you're there 
hands on doing the job, but don't forget you have academic commitments which require you to complete the, the program that you're on. So again, not forgetting that relaying information to your placement visiting users with the universities, with your lecturers, getting that portfolio ready. It, it's hard. <laughs> A lot of students would, would admit to the fact that doing your portfolio while placement is one of the most difficult things to juggle. But again, don't forget that. And the university is your link with that. So again, going back, going back to that foundation of communication already built and relying on that in order to get all that help to meet that academic commitment that you've made for the course. Thank you, that is fantastic. Thank you both very much. Um, Siobhan, if I could ask you to move to slide 19 for me, please, whilst you're working through that. So having had this discussion with uh, Rosabella and Christiana before, what happened was, um, you know, we came up with these whole series of strategies and there's just a list there for you. Um, uh, some, certainly some things for you to think about. And, you know, towards the end of this session, what I will be doing, because I've been watching the chat as well, there are a number of things that came up and I do want to address those as part of the, the presentation today. But really what I want to do is I want to end on um, a, a final slide. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this is again, and I, and I give all credit to um, uh, Prospera Tidum for developing this model and it's called the Mandela model and it, and it, it is a, a teaching and learning tool uh, uh, that really supports the supervisory relationship between the student and the practice educator and it's cyclical in its fashion but there's a clear starting point and it's flexible enough um, and really what it, it, it's the essence of good practice as far as your practice educator is concerned and if you're practice educator is not aware of this, again, this is an opportunity for you not only to manage your placement, to, but to support your practice educator to make the best of your placement as possible. And sometimes we have to do that, particularly if you're working with a new practice educator, because remember, practice educators don't just happen, they too need to be trained. And you may be working with a practice educator who is in their third, you may be their very first student. So there's a joint learning that needs to happen between you. But as you can see here with the Mandela model, it really does talk about the deliberate efforts that need to be made in order to support and enable a placement. So things like making time, acknowledging needs, recognizing the difference. You can't hide away from the issue of power within the practice educator and student relationship. It is there, but it is even further compounded when you have made, when you have issues of an ethnicity as well. It's important also to talk about your educational experiences, not with, not from a place of deficit, but actually what your previous education and also your work experience can actually bring. Uh, to the placement. Remember, you, you need to think of yourself as an asset to that organization, not with a big head, but obviously with humility, but recognizing all the skills that you bring with you. And also those skills will be rooted in your life experiences. And again, that's what you also have to bring with you. And I think certainly the final one around age, and I would also say gender. So if, they, if we have, um, uh, black students out there in the audience and you happen to be male, again, no one's actually done the research, but the, I'm hoping that somebody will do research around the experience, experience of black male social work students, because that is an extremely challenging experience at times. But there are very real ways of supporting students in terms of support groups, finding mentors for students. There's lots of ways in which students can be supported. And I suppose this, what I'm saying, is very much pointed towards practice educators and also educators in terms of social work and higher education. So we've set out the picture for you. I think there are some really key messages, particularly for black and minority ethnic students and for all students, simply this, you own your placement. 
Your placement is yours. It is the place where you show off your capability and skill as far as the, the PCF is concerned. So that's going to be hugely important going forward. But also, it's an opportunity for you to learn and to take that opportunity with open hands and create opportunities so that you can not only evidence the PCF, but also you can, you can also become an asset to the organization, hopefully over time, and whereby you can develop good relationships and learn from other practitioners who are part of the placement, placement team that you are part of. I think one of the other things that I want to say is that whether your placement is statutory or not, you still need to do your absolute best. It is an environment for learning. Please do use that. And ultimately, what I would say is just as much as the placement is yours, so is supervision. It's your space to do further learning. So go prepared go prepared. There's nothing more impressive to any practice educator than a student who is prepared for supervision. That wows most practice educators. Okay, so let's just move on. I think there is, uh, I think that's it in terms of uh, slides. What I want to do now in the last five minutes that we have got available, which isn't a lot of time, is really just open the, the floor really to any questions that came up in the chat. So uh, technical team, please help us out. Any that you think we, uh, myself, Christiana or Rosabella could answer. Yeah, we've, um, we've had a great question come in. It's from Lucas. Um, so if you bear with me, I will read it out. It says, with the current government which refuses to believe that systematic and institutional racism are even real issues that need addressing, combined with a media landscape that still regularly echoes anti-immigrant sentiment and us versus them mentality, what would you propose that we could or should do both as individuals and practitioners to promote widespread progressive societal change? Gosh, that's the million dollar question. It certainly <laughs> is. <laughs> okay. Um, I think you take one battle at a time you change one person's mind at a time. I think that's how you do it. You surprise people. When, if you think about what I've said about the unconscious bias that we all experience, to actually overturn that and to cause people to think differently, I think is the battle won in some way, in some form. And if that, can be, as I would say, um, contagious, all the better. But I think it is about a deliberate act of changing people's impressions of you. In terms of the wider societal factors, I think what we have to do is we have to call it as we see it. We should not be afraid. And I, as an academic, have been in situations where, uh, you know, um, how can I say, certain statements have been made, um, certain conclusions have been drawn, and I have had to find a way that is, I would say, non-threatening, so I don't fall into the existing perceptions and stereotypes in order to challenge that. But I also think in many ways that there are some individuals who do not see that there is a problem at all, i.e. as in that particular government report. Um, however, there are others that will speak to that. So I suppose if we're thinking about the profession as a whole, uh, thinking about yourself as an individual, you pick your battles and you seek to change minds through your behaviours, your attitudes and the way you work. In terms of the wider profession, there's a need to open up and to be honest and to really have that debate. And I think, you know, through the work that's been done by Siobhan and Wayne, I think that debate is happening. This session wouldn't happen without outlanders, take, you know, being written in the first place. Because I've never heard, other than through academics such as Prosper Tiedem, 
this is not a topic that is discussed greatly. And yet what we know is there are many black students who are coming into social work and there are many black practitioners. And if you read community care quite regularly, there's a whole debate happening there. Um, but in terms of wider society, we have to also rely on other agencies, other people with influence to begin to change the debate and to challenge. Um, and I think if there's any profession that should be able to have these discussions, it should be social work. We should be able to be brave and we should be able to begin these discussions, but also what we should be able to do is begin to think about change. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's an attempt to answering it. Well, um, I'm mindful of time as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, though, Jennifer, I think that was a huge question. So trying to it answer was. that in a couple of minutes is really tricky, isn't it? But um, I suppose one thing I would just say, just having, I'm very technologically challenged. I'm trying to look at the chat at the same time does get me. But I did manage to get into the chat at one point. And I noticed there's a few people saying that they feel scared about going into placement because of some of the, you know, some of the statistics that you shared earlier and some of the concerns that there are. And I suppose I would be looking at, um, I suppose a question around what what can we do in terms of advice to people who feel scared and from my perspective as a practice educator I would just want to I suppose say some of my thoughts about that uh, Jennifer if that's all right mm, yeah please I was struck when you were talking earlier you used a quote from Dole and Shardley which is you know it goes back to 1996 when they were talking about recognizing and naming and valuing difference not sentimentalizing it but really being out there and I know I do a lot of practice teacher training practice educator training and when I do that and I talk about these issues white practice educators particularly will say to me I feel frightened about raising mm -hmm. rates with the student and I think the students are also frightened about raising some of these issues and what I would say is the Mandela model for me is brilliant because it, it gives us that not just permission to talk about it, but a desire to talk about difference and name difference. And one thing I would say, and I would appreciate this as a practice educator. I mean, I think I, I like to think that as a practice educator, I put all of this out on the agenda from the outset of working with a student. But if you have some fears after listening to the research about black students and you're a black student going into a placement, tell your practice educator that, say, I have some fears because I have read the research and I have heard some of the concerns and these are my thoughts. What are your thoughts about that? And actually ask your practice educator because from the outset, you are then saying, look, I'm aware of this and how are you gonna be an ally to me as a black student? And I think that's actually really important. So that would be my advice to people who are scared is, be courageous and tell your practice educator that that's how you feel. And if your practice educator isn't able to work with that and address that, then talk to the university because you've raised your concerns and the fears that you have. Because fear impacts on learning and it will impede your ability to learn. Um, and I think it's really important that white practice educators are aware of these issues and talk about these issues with students. And I know that some have either a fear around that or actually some managers, I know I've talked about the importance of doing this, the importance of using the Mandela model. And I remember someone coming back to my training and saying, my managers told me I'm not allowed to do that because that could be seen as racist. And it was like, where are we starting from here? I mean, that's a few years ago now. But anti-racist practice has to get back onto the professional agenda in social work. And the key way of, of us doing that is through these conversations that are sometimes very difficult conversations, but are really important conversations. So I don't know what your thoughts are about that, Jennifer, or, you know, I know Prospera Tedham, who you've referred to a few times, mm. Prospera has been and spoken at some of our webinars and, um, you know, the, the Mandela cards, um, I think they've put into the chat now um are prosperous uh, material so i don't know what your thoughts are about what i've just said there jennifer but that that would be my perspective okay so i absolutely agree about the um conversation with the practice educator but actually there's also another partner in this and it's the university so again you need to have discussions with your university and 
as universities, we have a responsibility to support you. We have a responsibility to enable you. We have a responsibility to hear and minimize any fears or concerns that you have. And I talk as someone who led an, a master's program, okay? And someone who set up a group for black male social work students in terms of a mentor to support them, okay? So these are, you know, these are very real aspects of social work education, but also, if we look for them, there are also solutions that, that both support and enable students. So please, I think, you know, in terms of what Siobhan has said, do not let fear get in the way of your learning, because if it does, you will not achieve your ultimate dream. And really, I'm, I'm really mindful of, uh, of time, and I do want to finish on one final, final quote, but I don't know if there's any further questions or anything else that anybody wants to say? I would say go with that quote, Jennifer. I think that's absolutely yeah. fine. Okay. And this quote comes from Martin Luther King and he said, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. And your dream is that of the role of social worker stick to your dream, even though you may face difficulties of today and tomorrow. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for a very powerful and very informative presentation. And also, um, thank you to Christiana and to Rosabella for sharing their thoughts and, and people's um, responses and how people are going to, uh, the strategies that they find are going to be very unique and individual. And I think it's great that we have that kind of diversity of, of responses. And, and I know that everybody always really enjoys hearing from our student guests and newly qualified guests. So particular thanks um, to you for doing that. I suppose I was just thinking there about a quote. It actually comes from a film that I love. Shawshank Redemption is the film, but it comes from that. And the, the quote is, fear can hold you prisoner, but hope will set you free. And I think that's really important that all of us together as a community of social workers, both black and white social workers together have to have hope for anti-racism within social work. Um, but I would also make a call to every white practice educator to start thinking about this, start addressing this, start looking at why is there a language of deficit and are you using that language of deficit? I think that's really important. So thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. Um, and I'm gonna just leave those um, references up there for a moment or two, just to make sure that everybody can capture those. So um, we will send out a resource list after today. We know everybody who attends the webinars live, you'll get a list afterwards. And we will send you out some um, aspects around some of the support groups that we're aware of that could be helpful to many of you asking some uh, very specific questions about particularly placements. I'll also mm. try and take a look at those and give some answers to those as a practice educator, if I'm able to. So we'll get that. Um, email normally goes out at the weekend because the team will do that on their time off over the weekend. Um, so thank you very much again to our speakers. Just in terms of the links, we'll be going into the chat now for our sessions um, next week. We're, next week, we're going to be looking at moral injury. I'm going to be talking about moral injury as it applies to social workers working in the pandemic. I think it's a really important topic for us all to be aware of. I'm going to be talking about that, but then we're going to be joined because moral injury is something that comes from the military. We're going to be joined by two special guests from Forward Assist, which is a social work led organization working with veterans in the UK. It's the only one of its kind. It's an amazing organization that I want you to learn more about. And they're going to also share their work on military sexual trauma, which is a really important area for us to be aware of as social workers. And then we've got share coming up, uh, report writing and imposter syndrome based on team experiences. So we've got some really good sessions coming up. Can I just uh, do a plug for share? Cause I am so excited about how that session is shaping up. We're going to have a practice educator, a student and a person who has used services 
all coming and talking about share. I think it's the first time that there's ever been that kind of level of conversation about the use of a model in social work practice. And I think everybody will find that a really exciting session. I'm thoroughly excited about how that's coming together. And the final link that is going to go into the chat, because we know we've been joined by a lot of students tonight, and I'm hoping if you haven't already registered that you will. All of those students who should have graduated last year and had a fabulous celebration and all those students who will graduate at some point this year and are being denied that kind of fabulous graduating celebration because of COVID. As a team, we have organised a huge virtual graduation. We are, as a, there's a core group within the team and we are meeting every weekend to plan stuff. It is going to be such an exciting night. Hopefully by then you'll be able to get all your friends around, sit in the kitchen and do it together, get your family around, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, this is going to be an exciting night to celebrate social work and to celebrate your achievements. So I am really hoping that both Christiana and Rosabella will be joining us for that because they will both be a graduation from last year and from this year. So I'm really hoping that everybody that's here tonight, again, the link will go into the chat now because it's going to be such a huge event. We need people to register as soon as possible. So even though it's in June, please register for that if you intend coming tonight. So thank you so much again to Jennifer, to Christiana and to Rosabella. It's been a really um, thought provoking evening. So thank you very much and good night to everybody.